the environment and addresses such topics as digital resilience, privacy, cultivating compassion, overcoming shame, and equality for women. She is the founding board member of the Childhood Resilience Foundation and on the advisory board of Project Rocket. In fact, we had Project Rocket at our conference last year. And Monica is an ambassador for the Diana Awards anti-bullying program, just heard from Tessie, as well as supporting numerous other organizations in this space. And so without further ado, let's see if we can bring Monica up on the screen. There you are. Hi. Good morning. Hi. How are you doing? Good morning. Good, thanks. thanks. I'm on my second cup of coffee, so hopefully this will you. also go well. <laughs> Good for you. And you're on you're on West Coast time, right? Exactly. Yeah. But fortunately, I'm thanks. an early riser, so. Um... Thanks for rising early for us. Really appreciate it. Well, listen, I you know, there's so many different ways we could begin this. I, I want to go back to your... Um, 2015 TED Talk, which if folks here have not seen it yet, please, please go and have a look. Um, it, it's a very compelling presentation that you gave. Um, but in the middle of that, you just described yourself as patient zero in terms of losing your reputation on a global scale. What did, what did you mean by that? Uh, well, unfortunately, the scandal or investigation of 1998 happened at this very unique time in our history where we were seeing um, the proliferation of 24-hour news. The internet had come about in the early 90s, but we're now starting to see news networks have websites, um, their gossip websites, and then of course this sort of political narrative. And so what that meant for me was that um, instead of something happening, a, a news story breaking or information being transmitted kind of city to city, or maybe something we'd even see in our country once at the, you know, at the end of the day on the evening news or in the morning, this was now something that went global instantaneously. And that meant that there wasn't even, that in, even in the time that something would travel for more context to be given, it was um, an inst it was like switching a, 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 or flipping a switch, really, that I went from being a completely private person. I went to bed one night, a private person, and woke up the next morning known by the entire world for something no one wants to be known for. Hmm. So thinking about that, I mean, what, what has changed, and, but what has remained the same in those intervening 22 years, would you say? Uh, I would say we are not much better at, um, at context and uh, really valuing, I, th I think sort of weighting the importance uh, or understanding what it means to, to communicate something with such a, with such a loud and far reaching voice. And I think we're still kind of on that model of being first um, we've seen that happen even almost in a way, um, it's not quite the same, but in a smaller, in a smaller way that on social media, this idea of going viral, you know, so it's, it's like you want to be the first one or you want the most attention around what you're saying, but that goes against this idea of, um, really making sure what we're saying is in context and right. What's changed, uh, is that we are, I think that we are more aware of how support online can help shift a narrative and how important it is to maybe raise your voice when you see certain things um, happening or if you see somebody being destroyed, again, without context. Um, so I think in, in, in that way, we, we see some similarities and differences. The world around us has changed in many ways. So that cultural context in which something might sit is, is different too. Right, right. Okay, let's shift gears a little bit. Um, talk about the impact that the suicide of Tyler Clementi had. Oh, I have and for that. those folks who are listening in, mm -hmm. and we have folks from all over the world, they may not remember or have heard of Tyler Clementi. So if you wouldn't mind just giving a tiny backstory on that and then, and then talk about how it impacted you. Sure, well, I think they, they both of those sort of 
merge together. For me, I had um, I had been away for a weekend uh, visiting my best friend from college, and I was driving back, talking to my mom on the phone, and something about the the death of Tyler Clementi had come on the news while we were talking, and my mom started crying, and I hadn't heard about uh, Tyler's suicide over the weekend, and and. Really, his suicide had come about that uh, his roommate had secretly recorded him being intimate with another man, and Tyler wasn't out completely um, as gay to his to his community. And um, as his roommate um, started to, you know, started to share this or uh, make it more public, Tyler was increasingly. My understanding is Tyler was increasingly distraught. And uh, eventually, only really a few days later, jumped from the George Washington Bridge after he had been mocked online and exposed. Um, so, so on a personal level, uh, experiencing and learning about this from my mom, and we're both very sensitive people, but she was distraught in a way that I didn't, I didn't quite get. And so, as I thought about it later, I realized that she was. She just kept saying, his poor, poor family, his poor family. And I realized that she was reliving her own experiences from 98 when both she and my dad had had worried that I would literally be humiliated to death. Um, And that it was a real turning point for me in some ways of my life. I had, uh, at this point, I had a master's in social psychology from the London School of Economics. I was trying to figure out where, like, what was my life path going to be? And expe- like watching my mom's experience of, of Tyler and his family's tragedy really opened my eyes to seeing how the world online had changed since 1998. So whereas um, I had made a mistake and I was um, alone in some ways on the internet of being shamed, what was now happening, Tyler had made no mistake. And this was now happening to people um, who were not, you know, who were also private people uh, and, and happening in a way that, that was far more destructive. So that just opened my eyes really to how, how the world had changed and that in many ways um, public humiliation and shame were at the time and still a little bit now also a, a, a kind of a, a silent sin in our society, not something that we really wanted to talk about. This was before Brene Brown's incredible TED talk on shame and which I think really opened up a public conversation. Okay. Well, let's bring it a little bit more up to date. And why don't you describe for us the work that you're doing both here in the States and overseas on combating cyberbullying? Well, certainly, you know, been difficult this this past year for as as for everybody um, just adjusting that way. So it, it feels a little easier for me to talk about the last several years of activism work that I've done. But uh, I've been really fortunate. It, it, it's, it was wonderful to see Tessie on the panel before because uh, you know shortly before um, my TED talk, I after my. Sorry, I won't get so deep. I sometimes get very detailed. <laughs> it's like too much detail. Sorry. Um, but really, my work with the Diana Award uh, started from an interaction on Twitter. And Alex Holmes and I connected. And, and I, I know Alex has been connected to Fossey before as well. And they were really the first organization in this space who welcomed me into this space. And... Um, so I started to get to know about the Diana Award. I was incredibly impressed with what they were doing. I still remember the first video that they showed me where one of the young ambassadors had talked about that he had been a bull- he had engaged in bullying experience. And as a result of the program, he had now become an anti-bullying ambassador, that it allowed him to channel this change of energy for him. And, and the emotion that came with that just stuck with me. So um, I started working with the, with the Diana Award. I was, uh, Mackenzie Bezos had an organization called Bystander Revolution, which she was working on, which I, I joined as well and met the girls from Project Rocket. I call them girls still, they're, they're young women, but in my head, they're still girls. Um, uh, 
and, and just started to meet different organizations and groups that got to meet Tyler Clemente's parents and family and uh, the Tyler Clemente Foundation is doing really wonderful work as well. So what I found in some ways was um, that there was a place for me and a, and a way for me to work with a number of different organizations that, uh, that allowed me to amplify some of the voices or messages to, um, to share some of my experience in, in, although many who are involved there have their different in vivo experiences. Um, but, but what it meant from my uh, unique perspective and alongside all of that work, I was able several years ago to start uh, working with BBDO New York, the ad agency, on some public service announcements. And that became another big portion of my anti-bullying work. It usually, the last several years um, in October for Bullying Prevention Month, I you know, would do these campaigns that centered around a PSA with BBDO New York that we did um, as, a, as a way to bring a different kind of attention and messaging to this issue. I've always felt really strongly that, um, that, a, that a really captive creative can help shift social behavior in a way sometimes much faster than we could ever imagine. Does that, does that answer it or is that too much? No, yeah, no that's good. It, and you took me on to the next question, which is about the PSAs. Um, Talk about, you have a phrase called a more compassionate internet. What what does that look like and how would we get there? Um, I think that there, there, are, there are many prongs to that in a way. And one has to do with uh, the, the hardest one to shift, which is human behavior, <laughs> our, our own choices. Um, and that, that really requires looking in the mirror at... Um, how we're engaging with information and how we depersonalize or desensitize human beings online. But I think there's also a really big piece there, uh, which is probably the, the easiest way to move the needle. And that's around making more compassionate social media companies that baking compassion and the, and the lessons and the, and the teachings, which everybody probably who's watching, who's part of your conference is aware of that. Um, what are the things that we've learned from, from social media, the social media experiment and the internet experiment thus far that we can change? Are there ways to sort of um, nudge people towards more compassionate behavior than others? E even things, I mean, I, I was in a, um, in a, like a breakout session at one of the TED conferences a couple years ago. And someone was talking about, um, you know, just tapping into different sides of the brain. And I was thinking about, wow, I wonder, you know, are there ways social media that just the aesthetics of, of social media could actually not just more towards something softer and compassionate, maybe rather than aggressive. So, I mean, I think it's, it's really kind of looking at safety and protection um, from a, from a design perspective. And then of course, how are, how are people protected legally online? So I think all of those, um, those are all the, places that contribute to trying to make a more compassionate internet and really trying to encourage people to um, to be upstanders and to engage in pro-social behavior and kindness. Yeah. Now, I mentioned earlier in my introduction uh, that you write for Vanity Fair, and, and one of the most recent articles I saw of yours describes a rather traumatic moment that you had um, back in 2011, I think, where what, you were held at gunpoint in your car and you remarkably yeah. managed to get away, but that it led you to mental health professionals and others to help you deal with that trauma. And then in your piece, you link that to what's going on for us nationally and globally right now during this pandemic. And you talk about the forgotten F word. What, what's that word? And how would it impact us now? Right. It's a, it's another four-letter F word, but it's feel. And it's about feelings. Um, so, I, uh, but I, I think stepping back to that there's, um, you know, it's a, a lesson for everyone. One ginormous trauma in your life does not inoculate you from trauma that will, that may continue to happen down the line. I, fortunately, I think that I was doing uh, trauma work and, and spiritual work 
at the time helped me process the, um, I was almost carjacked. So I think that that helped me process that um, much faster. But really uh, why I was talking about that experience was um, reflective of what I've seen happen particularly in the US, but it's actually, you know, as I spoke to friends all around the world about this, it's, it's missing very much from our, our current pandemic conversation. And that's around this idea of valuing mental health in the same way that we do physical health. So the piece that I wrote, which, you're, which you mentioned, is really around advocating for a, um, a essentially the same role that Dr. Fauci is playing in our public conversations around the pandemic, but for mental health in connection to the pandemic. And um, uh, I am embarrassingly blanking on his name right now. Oh my gosh, there's a, um, oh, this is so embarrassing. Uh, Kirk Schneider. Okay, Kirk Schneider um, wrote in Psychology Today uh, in this last year about this need for a um, psychologist general, which he was saying, and so this was pre-pandemic, in this bigger way of like, we, we have a mental health crisis in our country, and we are going to have an even bigger mental health crisis that is happening um, as the pandemic sort of moves through, which is not only just from quarantine and isolation, but also as some of the panel was saying before, and I'm sure elsewhere, people have talked about today, what everybody's experiencing as a result of now being mainly, our lives are mainly online. So I think that it's where these kind of two worlds are coming together even more. Um, and I just think the, again, it ties back to that sense of, of so many of these uh, emotions that we experience and the feelings we have that we don't have public conversations around which lead to shame and silence mm -hmm. and that's as we know in the, in the bullying world as well that's where the most damage is done is when someone ha is uh sitting alone in shape so and not having kids yeah now let, let's pick up on that because i understand you're actually in the middle of making a documentary on public shaming can you mm -hmm. can you give us a teaser what what's it going to be sure. about what is it how can we see it um, so it will be out next spring on HBO Max. Um, they've been an incredible partner on this project um, thus far. And the director of the film is uh, was um, on Catfish for seven years. He was Nev's uh, kind of partner in crime, Max Joseph. And he has an incredible, he's got this amazing experience from having worked on Catfish of seeing, you know, public shaming. But he also has a, a, a really magical directorial eye in how to bring topics that, that could just be only heavy or only dry alive in a way. So we're, what we're doing is um, we're really exploring the topic of um, public shame, public humiliation, mainly online, and how this has created this culture of humiliation. We're looking at, I think the main questions we're really asking are how did we get here and where are we going? So uh, we are, we have um, interviewed some incredible, very resilient people who've had a range of experiences of how their lives have changed online. We've spoken to some um, unique and brilliant voices as experts. Um, we're hopefully going to be pulling, being able to talk to some people in different organizations. It's it's only ninety minutes as of now, so. We're, we're trying to find the balance and, and the through line and, and we're in the edit uh, and still filming as we speak. And it's, um, it's you know, the, the goal that we all have with this show is to really help open up and move forward a conversation around mm -hmm. um, online shaming and public humiliation and what role do we all play and, and do we want to fix it, and if we do, which I hope so, then how do we do that? Really. You know, given given your own personal experiences, um, and given the title of our conference, Building Resilience, what, I mean, what does, what does that mean to you? And, and for the young folks, we have a number of young activists who we're going to hear from later today. You know, what encouragement or advice would you give young people 
going through difficult cir circumstances, how can they build resilience? What, what, what can you share with them? Well, I think the um, probably the most important thing is actually what you've sort of in, encapsulated in this in building resilience, which is that resilience is a muscle that we can build. It's something that we can learn to become more resilient. We're all sort of born with different levels of it, but it it is a skill in a way that we can hone um, and. For me, I think that it's the things I learned, um, that I learned without realizing I was learning them, were really the, uh, that built my resilience, were, were things around relationships, how important those filial and relationships are and friendship relationships and, and that, you know, your family is, is hopefully going to be the ones who stand by you, that having people reflect back to you, um, who you really are to help ground you when you're, because I think, just sorry, just take a step back. I think when you go through some sort of a, a difficult situation, whether it's on a smaller, more personal level or on a, on a bigger, whether it's in your community or online and other people start to define you, it, especially the younger you are, the easier it is to really lose your sense of self. And once you start to lose your sense of self, how, how do you ground? How, how do you stay, how do you stay fortified um, in moments like that? And for me, it was my family and my friends who just continued to remind me, you know, my brother said to me once, I, I have a younger brother, um, he's four and a half years younger, and he said to me sort of in the midst of everything, he said, you know, to everyone out there, you might be Monica Lewinsky, but to us, you're still just Monka which is my family nickname. And there is something about that. You know, there, mm -hmm. there's something. Of, and so it's why I, I really, I, in, in the advocacy that I do, the two things that I think are most important are around not suffering in silence, you know, to, to tell someone and to also try as much as you can as, a, as an insurance policy to really build relationships. It doesn't matter how many you have. It's about the, it's about the quality of those relationships. Um, and then the other aspect of it is, is to please not shy away from getting help. There is nothing wrong with getting help. I think that um, particularly there's some cultural backgrounds that or countries where it's less quote unquote acceptable. Um, I think we, we probably still see some gender differences there, but that it is, it, it really can be the difference of, of life and death at times. Um, Monica, I'm, yeah. I'm really sorry. I'm going to have to jump in. We uh, okay. run out of time already. I'm sorry. Um, I'm so, I'm, no, not at all. I have so many more questions for you. Um, you know, uh, hopefully in future we can bring you to a physical location and have a have a longer chat. Right. But and you, you I, can I, have a symbol to make me speed up. <laughs> I, well, it, it's fine. You you you've shared your stories, and that's the most important. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Um, I urge people to go and have a look at the TED Talk, read her Vanity Fair piece, and we look forward to this documentary coming out next year. Monica, thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. Bye. Now listen, folks, we're going to be heading now into our breakout sessions.